It is a delight to be here, and obviously uh, we're among friends, and that makes it easy. And one of the things that I have advocated over the years, especially talking to young people coming in to uh, the uh, liberty movement, is that you ought to have fun doing it because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You know, some crazy guy might start a war someplace, or the economy may collapse, which is a possibility. So if you sit and ponder only that rather than thinking about what the strategy is to try to prevent it or prevent provide the answers to those problems when they really come forth. So it is, um, it is something to get together with like-minded people, invite new people in. There's always somebody new that, uh, are being, that will be introduced to these ideas, but uh, <coughs> it's, uh, it's important that we do enjoy ourselves. One thing that I um, often marveled at when I went to the universities during the campaign was the fact that I talked about <laughs> the dire straits that we're in. You know, our civil liberties being undermined, perpetual war, and uh, all, this, all the things that were, ha were happening that were all negative for us. And so often, uh, uh, you, you know, there was a lot of, you know, support for being positive. They say, what we like is your optimism. And I keep thinking, well, about 50%, no, about 80% of my talk was telling you what the problems were. But uh, of course, when you talk about liberty, and explaining it doesn't take you a long time to give people a little bit of hope by just understanding how liberty solves our problems that we need to deal with. I remember very well when I first met uh, Murray. It was in my congressional office. Uh, Lou, Lou Rockwell, somebody you know quite well, Lou was my uh, you know, chief of staff. Uh, he came to work for me in 1979. I had been in office in the early part of, uh, of, of 80s. Uh, uh, I, I was in one, one term, and I came back in office in 78, which started in 79. But uh, the one thing that we did share was uh, enthusiasm and understanding about uh, Murray's works, uh, and, uh, and we were enthusiastic about it. So one day, Lou and I were sitting there. I said, have you, have you ever met Murray? He says, yeah, I think I met him, but I don't really know him. I said, let's call him up and see if he might come and visit with us. And uh, he called him up, and Murray was there not too long after that. And I can remember the first day, uh, you, you know, the, um, his, his one statement. He says, I never thought I'd see the day when I'd meet a congressman that quoted me uh, in a speech and talked about fluctuating uh, fiat currency. So he was so amazed, and, and he made me feel very good that I knew at least what, what he was up to. But Murray uh, and Lou and I then uh, did a lot, a lot of work together not too long. That was probably in, in 79, maybe early 80s. But uh, in 1980, there was the uh, Gold Commission report passed by the House and the Senate, which was uh, set up to uh, study the role of gold in both domestic and uh, international affairs. And we had no dreams about what was happening, but we did have the commission, and I was on the commission. But actually, Murray came on board, and he uh, worked as a researcher for us. And uh, at the time, I was convinced that he didn't, he did, well, of course, we didn't have the internet, but I, I was convinced he didn't need any books. I think he was able to do his research right out of his head <laughs> because he was able to produce it. So we got to know him uh, uh, real well then. But uh, I think one of the things that uh, impressed me most uh, was the monetary issue because that's what got me involved in, in, in economics, politics. I, I wanted to talk about economics. I wasn't interested in politics. But um, the first time I ran for office was 1974 in the Watergate year. And uh, at that time, the Republicans in Texas had a total of three seats. So nobody wanted to run in a Watergate year, let alone in Texas as a Republican. But I did that just so I could talk about monetary issues. Well, sometimes politics leads to accidents and unusual events and un unintended consequences. And what happened was I got elected. <laughs> 
Carol worried about that. She says, what are you doing this for? She says, you're, you're liable to get elected. I says, there's no, no way that, that that's going to happen. But she says, there's a danger of that. You can't tell. And, you know, I remember asking her, why would you think that? She says, people will recognize you're telling the truth. And uh, I, I think there's something to that, that people do recognize that. Because, you know, when we did the presidential campaigns, I would talk about the Constitution and, and living up to your promises and all the things that uh, we take seriously. But other candidates would say the same thing. So they would come up and they say, well, I like what you're doing, like what they're doing. I said, well, they, they essentially say the same thing. I said, why don't you accept them? And they said, we don't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's one thing is, if you're talking to a Murray Rothbard or you're talking to somebody at the Mises Institute, uh, we and they were all believable, believable. And I think that makes a big difference. That's the big hurdle, because you can listen to a lot of garbage and you get a lot of garbage from our university. You see a lot of garbage on the internet, but the thing of it is, is it believable? And now that we live in the age of fake news, there's a bigger challenge. But I still think the message of liberty is believable and it is not difficult to explain and that's why we should be excited about it. I remember very well the last time I, I talked to Murray, and uh, that was at the beginning of 1995, and uh, uh, Murray passed away on the 7th of, uh, of January. So it was either at the end of December or the beginning of January, I had just made a decision that I was uh, going to attempt to go back to the belly of the beast and run for Congress again. And uh, he knew exactly what I was all about. I was not interested in the political career or just having a platform to talk about the issues I thought were important. So I, I called him to tell him that because it was obvious that uh, I thought he would uh, welcome the news, and indeed he was. So that was one of my great disappointments that uh, he, he didn't get to see the results of that election because you start early on, the beginning of, of 95 was for the election of 90, uh, 96. And at that time, I uh, tried to get the support of Republicans, uh, which was very, rather naive. So I went to the Republican and I said, I want to run against this congressman we have. He's a Democrat, and you know, I know you don't like Democrats. And they nod, and I met with our delegation. I thought I'd, I'd get some support. And um, I, because I promised them, I said, I can get rid of that Democrat in this office. And you know, in about three weeks, I did. I got, I got rid of him. They got him to be, convert to become a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> So then Newt Gingrich and the senators and all the congressmen poured the money into the district in order to, to support him. But uh, the, the, whole, the whole thing is, is that uh, uh, the issue of politics always comes up. Should I run for office to, pr to promote the uh, cause of liberty? <laughs> and my usual advice is, don't bother, <laughs> you know, uh, and, unless it's done for the right reason. If you're doing it to be uh, a politician or in office or to win or become a chairman, a lot of people argue, well, Ron, you need to back off a little bit because you could become chairman of the banking committee. And if I would have done everything I was supposed to do at the beginning and stayed in continuously, I would have had the seniority and I could have uh, become a chairman of a, of a department, chairman of the banking committee. Think of all the good things I could do as chairman of the banking committee. And uh, the, whole, the whole thing is, I said, yeah, that is true. And then you have to raise about $20 million in order to buy that chairmanship. And I said, uh, yeah, I could be. But I think that uh, in, in the meantime, I would have lost my soul in order to do it. <laughs> Well, I want to uh, read a quote uh, to talk a little bit more about what our challenges are and, uh, and, and, and what we're up against, uh, because I think most of us know exactly what the answers are, and they have been uh, in so many ways provided by people like Murray and so many others in this audience that continue this tradition. But I want to read a quote, and I'm not going to tell you who this quote is from, but I'll give you a hint. He used to be mayor of the New York City. 
<laughs> and he, he ran for the presidency once and didn't do all that well. <laughs> But th this is the quote I want to read because I think it's, uh, it tells us a lot about the enemy. It, actually, if it tells you what I think it tells you about the enemy, they shouldn't be that hard to defeat. <laughs> I'll tell you why. <laughs> now, this, this is the way the mayor talked. What we don't see is that freedom is not a concept in which people can do anything they want, be anything they can be. Freedom is about authority. Freedom is about the willingness of every single human being to cede to lawful authority a great deal of discretion about what you do. <laughs> that tells you where they're coming from. And, uh, and he did not win the presidency, but it seems like almost anybody that ends up in the presidency actually believes this garbage. <laughs> So, but that's, that's the enemy, and that should be uh, easy to uh, take, take care of. You know, I work on the assumption that our, our uh, efforts are getting easier. Um, it's long and tedious, but I think we have done the work, I think philosophically and intellectually, the groundwork has been laid by so many here, by Lou Rockwell with the Mises Institute, and when we had the spontaneous rallies during the campaign, uh, I remember one in particular very early on in 07 at the University of Michigan. It was not I that became a cheerleader and, you know, say, well, this is what we're going to do. We're going to chant this and this and that. It started spontaneously, and, uh, and, and that is the reason that one little booklet I wrote about uh, the Fed, it, they started chanting, and the Fed, and the Fed, and uh, burning Federal Reserve notes. Now, that didn't come from me. I might have cheered them on. I might have encouraged them. But the message has already been out there. And even in a university, a university of, of Michigan, liberal university, there's always a group in there. And, and that is, the, of course, the, the group we want to talk to and talk with and, and motivate those who are leaders in the ideas of liberty because, as uh, we should remember, uh, numbers are unimportant. Uh, well, numbers are important, but it isn't a numbers game only. You can't wait until we have the conversion of 51%. You have to have the conversion of the philosophic leaders of a country, the teachers, the universities, the movie theaters, the newspapers, and everything else talking about something else. And this is where we lost out, especially since the 1930s, because the universities were then, and they're still doing it, they were teaching uh, socialism, communism, and especially Keynesianism. The Americans like Keynesianism, and they like intervention. It's softer. It's not as quite as authoritarian. Uh, they don't put their guns in your face. They used to not put them in our face, but they do more often now, which, which is a problem. So, uh, but intellectually, that has happened, but now they're under, under siege because of one reason, it's failing. Just as the Soviet system was doomed to fail, though very, very few said, you know what, in, in 1989, 1990, the Soviet system is going to come crashing down and there's going to be this uh, revolution going on. Well, I always marveled at that, thought it was a great event because uh, I was drafted in the military in the 1960s and we were warned about the Cold War and nuclear exchanges and that was, uh, you know, not totally unnecessary. It was a bad idea. Communism was a horrible idea. It killed itself. But Keynesianism right now is killing itself and we better be there to help fulfill the replacement. You know, the um, GDP is used frequently and sometimes not uh, accurately, but uh, sometimes it will give us some information. There was a chart on the internet this week and showed about the GDP according to the individual. And the line throughout recorded history was a line like this, because before the Industrial Revolution, it's just what you as an individual could produce and not much more. 
until, you know, the Industrial Revolution, and then GDP per individual goes like this, skyrocketing. But it was during the time of the Industrial Revolution that uh, we had the recognition of the individual and uh, understood liberty better than in the past, and it was, uh, you know, endorsed by the principles of the founders of this, of this country, and it had some religious connotations of the importance of the individual, and uh, so we live in very uh, a sh a short order. Uh, what we're witnessing, the recording of uh, true history, is very, very minimal. And I like the analogy, and don't tell me to prove this, but there's been some estimates that if you took all of the history of the, of the, um, the billions of years of the presence of our solar system, uh, then, and you broke that down to 24 hours, mankind's been around for about 10 seconds. You know, and it's, and it's just amazing how quickly things move. And right now, we live in an era where things are moving quicker than ever. So yes, the, um, the, the GDP grew, grew miraculously, and uh, we have this communication, which is a double-edged sword. It's great that we have the internet and we spread our message, but we also have the collusion of big government and the internet and uh, the companies that will be willing to uh, provide information to our government. So it's indeed a two-edged sword that is going on. But I think the way I see it, things are moving very, very rapidly and uh, things can happen quickly, wars can break out, and the system can f f fall apart. The bank banking system is very fragile, and uh, something has to replace it. Now, the Soviet system collapsed, and there was a replacement, and I figured that was a great event, but it looks like they want to sort of copy us, you know, interventionism and uh, government controls and central banks and taxing system. So as beneficial as that was, it did not come up with a libertarian answer. So the only way we can improve things, and it's a challenge, and I think it's available like never before in history, is to have the intellectual community preaching one message, and that message is very simple and clear. Liberty solves our problems, governments do not. You know, and the whole question is, where, where are the people that are going to help us? You're op they say, you're optimistic, Ron, but there's nobody out there. We can't find anybody. Go to the universities. Well, I find them when I go there. Yes, their numbers are limited. But, uh, you know, there's a biblical story that talks about this, looking, looking for the remnant. And, uh, of course, Isaiah was instructed to go out and talk to the remnant and, uh, and tell them good what was going on. But uh, God warned Isaiah, don't worry. I mean, one thing is, is, is you're not going to find anybody and nobody's going to listen to you. And uh, he said, well, I, I will go out and do this. And of course, nobody could really identify. Elijah tried to identify the, the remnant, but he had difficulty doing it. And it was small in number. But the remnant is out there. And I see what's happening is that remnant, I, I see it popping up when I go around the country. And uh, I think it's more significant than, than we realize. And I feel like there's a remnant. And so the old right is a remnant of the, the understanding of what liberty was all about. And I see Murray as sort of in a transition of the, of the old right and the picking up of a remnant. I think of, of, of uh, uh, Leonard Reed as part of that and the many others in the old right and, and Murray identified with them. And, and then Murray actually introduced the new age of libertarianism intellectually. And now just look, it was mentioned about how fantastic uh, his works were, and, and they're living now more than they were when he was alive. And you can't kill these ideas like this. You can't kill an idea whose time has come. We know that. And the idea of liberty, the time has come. So we should be very happy about what's happening, but concerned enough that we have to keep searching uh, for those and, and growing what we'll call the remnant, even if we don't fully identify each and every one of them. And uh, the, uh, the, whole, the whole purpose is the, uh, that uh, the instruction to Isaiah was that uh, uh, they're, they're out there, and uh, you won't be able to find them, but they'll find you. 
So yes, the Mises Institute or anybody else involved in this, you and we can't personally go out, identify them and grab them and put them to work. No, but if the message is allowed and clear and if it's positive and it's moral and it provides practical benefits over all the authoritarianism, they will come. They will come and just think of the growth of the Mises Institute. Think of what Lou did in, uh, along with Murray, you know, in, in 1982, started the Mises Institute. And meetings like this go on constantly by the Mises Institute, bringing new people in. So um, the people will come. And, uh, and, and that, to me, it has always been an encouragement. You know, I spend a lot of time, uh, you know, trying to put my little program together, the Ron Paul Liberty Report. And uh, when I get, <laughs> thank you. But I do uh, my, a lot of my paperwork and reading and attempts at writing and things like that uh, at my house. And I have a nice office and, uh, and what, um, I get tired of it. You know, an hour or two, I get a little restless. My bones get restless. And I don't sit still. I know some people. Now, Murray was one that uh, his bones rested, you know, from 3 in the morning till 1 p.m., but then his bones were restless, and he got up and, you know, and he got busy. But when I get restless, I have a couple things to do. Uh, first, I need a little exercise and, and a little bit of movement. So I do that. I walk and ride bikes and swim and keep active. But the other thing I do is I get involved in gardening. You know, I love the garden. For instance, right now, I can tell you, if, if you don't live in the South, you won't understand, but my tomato plants are this high, and I have blossoms on my tomato plants, and I'm hoping to get my winter crop in, and I'll watch those tomatoes grow and take care of them. So that, that to me, is, is important. But I also like to work with plants and grass, mow my lawn, and keep my lawn mowing. So, when I mow the lawn, this is the kind of thing I think about. We have Bermuda grass and we have uh, St. Augustine. And St. Augustine is a great grass. You know, that crawly stuff we used to call gra crab grass. But St. Augustine is beautiful. And you know what? You don't need to do a heck of a lot for it. What you need to do is when the weeds creep up and before they go to seed, you mow them. Mow them down. So your job to have a nice lawn is to cut down the weeds. For us to have a great economy, what all of us have to do is cut down the bad ideas and the weeds, and the grass will grow. <laughs> this winter, though, I have to confess, I was listening to too much of the government propaganda, and they said, Warm is, warmth is coming, don't worry about it, your area won't see frost anymore, just don't, don't worry about that. And um, we were at the frost line, and um, I, I, I thought, well, if it's getting warm, I don't have to take in my uh, plants. And I've had uh, some very, very nice plants that I take care of, and Chevalier is beautiful, Chevalier is. And uh, there was one chevalier that I had there that uh, I, I grew from a stem. It was a single stem. It was about that high, but it had a nice bush. And I knew that I have, uh, you know, brought this plant to life, and, and, uh, but I left it out. And I left my big chevaliers out and left a lot of other ones out. And they all froze badly. And chevalier especially, right to the bottom. You couldn't see a thing. And even the, the stalk was gone. And uh, so spring came, and I have somebody working for me. He says, why are you watering there? There's nothing there. I said, there's, but there's a root there. And I said, that root may just come back. I don't know, but I believe it was big enough that it will have retained some of the root system. There's a remnant of that bush under that ground. So I kept watering and watering, and I go, I don't think this is going to work. Work. One day we were sitting out on the patio, and Carol was there. She said, "What do you have in there?" I said, "Oh, there's a plant." She said, "What's that little green thing right there?" <laughs> so she discovered, and I said, "Wow!" I said, "This plant is going to make it." But you know, the magnificent thing about that plant—it's now like this, but it's not a single plant, a plant, a uh, single stem. It has dozens of little stems and it looks very bushy. So the setback with the frost actually created a great plant 
But he came back, and all it needed was a little TLC, a little bit of water, a little bit of sunshine, no fancy fertilizers, no digging, nothing else. So I think that uh, sometimes that's all we need to do. Cut down the weeds and give them a little water and give them a little sunshine, and liberty will thrive. <laughs> Now, I want to uh, <clears throat> counter uh, the mayor's quote with one of Murray's quotes. And we want to answer that mayor, although I thought the best answer I ever got during the campaign was, uh, you know, they didn't expect me to do well. I think I did better than they claimed. But the neatest headline was after two or three primaries, um, I was like second or third, but uh, at the early stages, they were pumping pumping up Giuliani. And the headline, I think it was in Los Angeles, and uh, the headline was, Ron Paul beats Giuliani for the second time. <laughs> so uh, so he, he I, I got a little uh, enjoyment out of that. But Murray gives us even better enjoyment about counteracting that nonsense, this uh, justification for authoritarianism and the force of government. And this comes from uh, a, a new liberty. Uh, Murray says, one liberty can achieve man's prosperity, fulfillment, and happiness. In short, libertarianism will win because it is true, because it is correct policy for mankind, and truth will eventually win out. I think that is absolutely true. I really do. And uh, a lot of time I confess when I gave my talks, and I said, well, you know, I recognize if I listen to my talk or if you type it up, I'll recognize all my errors and all my mistakes. And, and uh, this could have been said better. And this could have been done better. I should have paused here and that sort of thing. But the one thing that nobody has been allowed to challenge me on is the authenticity of the message of liberty. C.S. Lewis uh, had a statement that he explained that uh, we're all like a bunch of eggs, an egg, and he thought that just being a good egg is not all that much of the solution. He says if you're an egg and uh, you're a viable egg and you do nothing if you don't hatch, what happens? You rot away. It becomes a bad egg, and nobody wants to know anything about it. But he says mankind and individuals should be hatched, and that is become something, become a bird that can fly or do whatever. And I think that has been so much of our problems. We, we have these ideas of what to do, and sometimes the individuals who don't come to me like this, they don't even understand that, and they don't have much desire uh, to, to do it. But I think that is, uh, you know, the, the important thing. So often the young people at the universities would say, yeah, all right, Congressman Paul, I agree with you, that sounds good, but tell me what I should do. I want to know what to do. And I, very, I gave them a very complex answer. I said, do whatever you want to do. <laughs> because because uh, everybody's going to do something differently. Just, just go out and do it. And remember, if it's worth anything, they'll find you. They'll find you. Somebody will. Somebody will use you. So as far as I'm concerned, the most important thing we do, and something that I worked on for many, many years and decades, is trying to understand the message, starting to understand the importance of liberty. I'm also convinced that we're all born with a libertarian instinct. But I think at a very early age, you know, if the terrible two gets into trouble, we have to suppress that. If the teenagers want to branch out, well, we have to protect them, but also it's an individuality. But by the time you get to the universities, you have to conform. You have to conform with the system. And certainly if you want to get ahead in, in, a, in a political sense in Washington, you better conform or else. I think the amazing thing that uh, I personally think is, how in the world did I ever get elected? And how did I get reelected? You know, but I think the truth does help. And I think the district, 
I think having a, a big family that would be seen throughout the district and Carol going with me, it's helpful. Those are helpful things to, uh, for people to see. But if, uh, if, if everybody has a job, uh, it, there'll be difference. And we, and we have a responsibility, and Mises talked about this, and Hayek talked about it, that, I, and I always put the onus on the young people who come, I said, if you understand this message and you feel comfortable with it, I believe you have more moral responsibility to deliver the message and spread it than somebody who doesn't even know what's going on because you do know what is the truth. But we have to continue to work on refining it and delivering it. Why, it baffles me, why is it that if we have a message of liberty, which is a moral issue, uh, which recognizes peace and prosperity, and uh, no aggression, no wars. Why, why do we do such a lousy job? Why, why do we get overwhelmed? And uh, it, there's various reasons because one, one thing that I think happens is when that GDP started going up, people did like materialism. We all like materialism. We like nice things. But they concentrated on the material benefits of liberty, which means better houses and cars and everything else. And that was easy to do until those who decided, yes, this is great. I want more. I want control. I want control of the banking system and the military industrial complex. We want to spread our message. We want to spread American goodness. Make sure everybody knows how great we are. And, uh, and, and then that prosperity that introduced this notion of using force to create more prosperity, what did it do? It destroyed the ability to produce. And if you look at the economic statistics, that's one of the big problems we have. We have a lot of people that are underemployed and the production isn't as great as the government tells us. And uh, that's why a lot of people live in poverty. Mises said the middle class gets wiped out if you wipe out a, 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 a currency. And that's where we are. But the answer is a beautiful answer because it, it satisfies people of all faiths and those without faith because it allows the individuals to make up their mind as long as they follow that rule of no aggression. If you can follow that principle and live up to your promises. Not too complicated, uh, but why haven't they listened? My explanation is they got too, too greedy and forgot about how, this is, uh, how the wealth has been created. So when the crunch comes, hopefully it's not so bad that we lose all efforts to spread our message but it's a wonderful opportunity for us to spread a message. And I find it's already that way. A lot of people know there's something very much wrong. Uh, they don't have the answer yet. So our responsibility as individuals is very clear. Our responsibility in organizations. And uh, it's amazing to me how many young people I meet in the last few years that were influenced way back in 07 and 08, and they have their own organization. I mean, I have no idea where they are. And who has an idea who their friends are on their, you know, Facebook. The message is out there and spreading much more so. So my conclusion is there's a lot to be optimistic about. It's a moral issue, and we can't be more thankful than we are today about how well Murray was able to present this message and all the work that he has done. It should inspire us all to continue to do our very best. Thank you very much.